welcome on into the Limitless Leadership Lounge. We're so excited that you're joining us today. I'm, I'm John Gehring, along with Dr. Renuma Kareem, who is all, also the founder of uh, Heroes for All, the organization we're in partnership with here uh, in the lounge. And also, of course, Coach Jim Johnson, uh, coach, former coach, and now speaker and author. So we're so glad to be with you today. And today we also have a special guest that we want to introduce to you in just a moment. We're looking forward to getting some great actionable leadership advice for you, the young and emerging leader. But first, do want to remind you, if you're listening up on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Spreaker, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube, we'd uh, really love it if you'd give us a, a subscribe, you'd give us a like, and you'd also, of course, hopefully leave us a review too, because we'd love to hear what we can do better to serve you, the young and emerging leader. So coach, we're going to have uh, coach introduce our guest here, Alan Stein. We're really looking forward to it today. So coach, I'll take it away. I'm really excited. Uh, Alan Stein Jr. and I have known each other for a while because we came from the same world. We were basketball guys. Uh, Alan was a trainer and one of the best in the world at what he did. He's worked with all kinds of high school, college, and some of the elite NBA players such as Kevin Durant. Uh, So he Although I see uh, Kevin is looking for another trade, so we'll see where he goes on that. Uh, but uh, Alan is uh, a guy that I admire greatly because he's just a really good man and he uh, is really diligent and he's made the transition kind of like what I did, although we had a little bit different, is uh, Alan, I met uh, a number of times and at a conference, he was sharing that he was deciding that he was gonna go into the keynote and workshop industry and do a lot with businesses. And he's made that transition uh, great. Yeah, he's spoken to some big companies like Pepsi and Under Armour and many more. And also he's written two wonderful books, Raise Your Game, which I uh, have read and it's outstanding. In fact, I gifted it to a number of my friends and business people. And I'm actually working on, I'm almost done with his next book called Sustain Your Game and uh, another outstanding book uh, that. Uh, he really talks about, because I know when I talk to business leaders and leaders of uh, athletic programs, they ask me, how do you get to the top? And then we, there's a process to that. But then the second one is in sustain the game is how do you stay at the top, which is even more difficult. Alan is also the father of three children, uh, and we're really excited to have him here today. So welcome, Alan. Oh, Coach, it's so great to be with you and, and with all three of you. I've been looking forward to this since we put it on the calendar, and that feeling and sentiment is very mutual, my friend. I, I really appreciate your kind words, and I'm looking forward to a fun conversation and hoping I can add some value. Absolutely. I, I know you will. So I'm going to start with, um, because, you know, obviously with even magnified greater with COVID, is the fact that people have made a lot of transitions in recent times, but you made a transition, it was before COVID, but you've done it extremely well, going from an elite basketball trainer to now this prolific keynote uh, speaker, workshop leader, and also author. So I'm curious, can you uh, give you know, people that are thinking about making that transition in your life some advice? Be happy to, you know, it was one of the the best decisions that I've ever made, but it was a difficult decision because I was leaving a space that I thoroughly enjoyed and had spent 15 years building up a certain level of, of name recognition and credibility. And, and, and as you know, since that's what connected you and I, I have so much reverence and respect for not only players and coaches, but for the game of basketball itself. So to leave the direct training space and jump into a new space of keynote speaking and writing, um, I gave it a tremendous amount of thought. Uh, and I can say that the seed to that had actually been planted 10 years prior to me making that decision. When I attended, uh, I was working a camp for the NBA, uh, as the NBA Players Association Top 100 camp. Uh, and they brought in the top 100 high school players and a ton of former NBA players and coaches uh, to, to be role models for these young men and kind of teach them what they need to get to that elite level. And they brought in a, a keynote speaker, a gentleman that you may know, coach Walter Bond. I do um, know Walter. Yes. Who also comes, you know, kind of from the basketball to business world. Right. And, and I remember at the time sitting there, you know, this was 15 years ago from now and, and listening to Walter and he was just such a, a compelling and captivating storyteller. You know, he had this group of, of literally of alpha males. He had us laughing. He had us crying. He had us thinking. He took us on a real emotional journey. And I remember sitting there in that moment thinking to myself, I want to do that one day. I don't want to do it now. I love the training that I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. But one day I want to do that. 
And then if you fast forward, you know, a decade later, um, and, and I know we'll get into this a little bit later because it's one of the themes of the book, I started to experience some burnout. Uh, I started to get burnt out on performance training specifically for basketball. And I knew it was time for me to make a change. And I had remembered that seed that Walter had planted, you know, a decade previously and realized this is the time, you know, this is the time. All, everything is lining up that it's, it's kind of a, a poetic end to my career in the basketball training space. And it's time to take that leap and capitalize on the seed that had been planted before. And uh, yeah, that, that event where you and I reconnected uh, in Los Angeles was like the first step in that journey. And um, yeah, I haven't looked back. And it was one of the best decisions I've ever made because I absolutely love what I get an opportunity to do now. Awesome. I, I just love the story and uh, transitioning. I think uh, we have to, as human beings, we need to transition from one stage to another. We cannot stay constant. So that should be our story. And while I'm, uh, and, and while we are talking about transitioning, I, uh, I'm a Penn State alum, so I am wearing my Penn State T-shirt also. And, uh, and I'm just so thrilled to see that your quote, uh, it was the quote on, are the habits you have today on par with the dreams you have tomorrow? This was in the Penn State Football Training Center. Uh, so Penn State went through that transition also. I remember Joe Powell, when I was a PhD student, Joe Paterno was such an amazing image, uh, signing football and everybody looked up to him. But when the unfortunate event happened and he was fired, the whole morale and spirit just went down. So when you find, if you find some groups like that, a team like that, who are moral is down and they're still uh, worrying about the mistakes and the scars they're going through, how do you motivate them and inspire them to be back into the state that they were once before? What a beautiful question. And, and, and before I answer that specifically, I, I do want to say something just about transition, because I'm so glad that that's kind of what we've transitioned into with this conversation. And, you know, when you think about it, a good portion of our life is spent in transition. I mean, transitions are happening all of the time. I mean, I, I've got young children now. I've, I've got 12 year old twin sons and a 10 year old daughter, and I'm watching them go through so many different transitions at present. I mean, think about over the course of our life, some of the big ones, you know, you, you transition from middle, you know, from elementary school to middle school and then middle school to high school. And then many choose to transition to, you know, upper education or college, or you transition into your first job. You know, you transition from being single to hopefully meeting that special someone and, and getting married like John's about to experience. Right. You, know, you you go through the transition of of being uh, single to then having children and, and caring for others. Uh, you know, you transition from from house to house and from car to car and from job to job. And, you know, as we've discussed from industry to industry, there's so many things in our lives that are transitioned and and how you handle these transitions ultimately determines not only how well you perform, but your level of fulfillment as well. And, right. you know, as as coach, I know you know this a good portion of success in the game of basketball is based on transition, mm -hmm. how well you get back in transition defense and stop easy layups for the other team and how well you sprint on offense in transition and get easy layups for your team. I mean, there's, there's no easier two points in the game of basketball than a wide open layup. Mm -hmm. and, and the goal in basketball is to get as many of those as you can on your team and prevent the other team from getting as many of those as they can. So this concept of transition it's something that we're always in. And, and, you know, another term for this that I learned from a, a mentor of mine is liminal space hmm. and liminal space is kind of that gap in between the transitions. You know, the, the, the best way to describe it is if you were, you know, you were kind of on a trapeze and you're, you're holding on to one bar and before you can grab the next bar, you kind of have to let this one go in order to create the space oh, to yes. grab the next bar. Hmm. And that little bit of, of time where you're in midair is a little scary. And it's a little uncomfortable, but if you don't let go of the previous bar, you cannot grab the next one. So we have to be willing to lean into transitions and embrace transition. And, you know, I, it's, I've come to the conclusion, there are two distinct types of transition. There's the transition that is imposed on us that there's nothing we can do anything about, you know, a, a perfect example of that would be a two year global pandemic, which has caused <laughs> many people to transition in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but the other types of transition we initiate, we choose to make these changes. Mm -hmm. You know, we choose as, as emerging leaders, we choose to grow 
to develop, to evolve, to get better. We choose whether or not to let go of the current trapeze bar to grab the next one. So um, to me, and, and, and my work actually focuses on both. It's mm. how to have a thoughtful response when transition is imposed on you. And it's how to be very proactive in initiating your own transition. So I just wanted that to kind of set the, the foundation. But to answer your question specifically, and Penn State is such a perfect example um, of when you do make a transition, you know, regardless of the context around it, I think there's a few things that are really important. Uh, one, I always believe in being, in being honest and vulnerable. You know, I believe in, in being forthright and addressing the proverbial elephant in the room. Um, so I, I think as far as using the Penn State as the example, I think it is okay to acknowledge some of the things that happened previously. Right. Um, it's okay to acknowledge some of the indiscretions and maybe mistakes that people made. Um, I believe you should acknowledge those with empathy and compassion, uh, not to say, and, and I know this one is kind of a slippery slope because those indiscretions mm. were pretty massive. So I'm and by no means... Uh, condoning any of the behavior that went on. Right. But I think for, the, for, for Coach Franklin and the new coaches that come in, it's okay to acknowledge that things happened before that we don't approve of and we're not, you know, our preference to put it lightly. However, we can't control what's already happened in the past. All we right. can do is set the tone moving forward. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, here's what our core values are. Here, here's the non-negotiable culture that we're going to create. Here's how we're going to hold everyone accountable with love and discipline in order to, to live out this culture. And here's where we're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. So it's acknowledging the past, but not getting stuck there and not living there. And it's about designing your future in the present moment by the decisions you make. And, and, and I'll say, I, I think Coach Franklin has done a brilliant job of that uh, at Penn yeah. State specifically. But anyone taking over a new organization, if they're if you've been marred by any type of black mark on, on, from the previous regime, that's the approach I would take. I would say it's okay to acknowledge it uh, and try to do so without judgment. Try to do so certainly without blaming, complaining, or making excuses. You know, just simply say, "Hey, you know, the the previous leader chose to do things this way, um, and that was their right." Um, I'm going to choose to do things a little bit differently and here's how I'm going to do it. And then set clear core values, clear standards, clear expectations, hold everyone accountable. And then as leaders, which I think is the most important part for any emerging leader to know is you need to model the behavior that you want to see in others. And then if you're going to expect it of someone on your team, you have to expect it of yourself. Yeah. Talk and learning that. from mistakes. Okay. That's such, such an important, uh, if you do not learn from your mistakes, then it's, uh, it's, uh, we, you just, it's uh, damned, but, but mm -hmm. we have to learn from our mistakes and some people learn some do doesn't. So, yeah. uh, and you talked about uh, detach, uh, one of the uh, uh, podcasts I've heard that uh, you talked about detachment. Uh, so, and you're talking about the present moment and I read Eckhart Tolle as uh, the power of now. And how important it is to be at that present moment. So what is your take on the importance of leaders giving that value of detachment and being in the present moment? Sure. And, and very similar to before, before I touch on that, I want to say something else because you, you, you hit on something really important and I don't want us to gloss over that. Okay. Ultimately, what you said made me think of... Um, kind of a quote or a mantra that's been around a lot longer than I've been around. And I've been here almost five decades. And, and that is this concept of you don't win or lose, you win or you learn. Right. And, and there's something about that that's really powerful. And, and I've heard that forever. And, and I've, I'm a self-diagnosed quote nerd. Like I've been oh, writing down yeah, quotes, <laughs> you know, since I was my children's age and I, I love quotes, right. but I'll say, I think the premise behind win or learn is sound. And I know what they mean. But I do think it's a little bit incomplete. And I want to touch on that real quick before I talk about detachment and being present. See, when someone says win or learn, I think it makes two assumptions that, that can sometimes be dangerous. The first assumption is they make it sound completely binary, as in either you win or you learn. And, and coach, I know you know this. You can actually learn from winning also. Like winning doesn't, I mean, uh, learning doesn't just occur when you lose. In fact, you should always be open and aware to learning in every circumstance. Um, you know, when you win, you can learn what behaviors worked well for you and how you can repeat those to win again in the future. But you can also have the humility to say, yeah, we may have had the most points on the scoreboard today, but we did not play very well. 
We did not execute. We did not play hard. We were just simply more talented than the other team. But boy, did we develop some sloppy habits today. So we need to learn that lesson. Now, we should be thankful that we learned a lesson and still got a W, right. but we don't want to rest on that. So that's part of it. And the other well, part- Can I, I interject one thing? Uh, you, please. You really, uh, you, 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 is so true. And I remember one of the best teams I ever had uh, our slogan that year was raising our standards, you know, that we're going to play to our standards. Okay. And we were really good. And so we beat a team one night by 25 points at home. And one of our procedures was after the game, we always had a team wrap around and they answered two questions. What did we do well? And what do we need to work on? And one of our captains succinctly said it so well, he said, coach, we didn't do anything well tonight. We didn't play to our standard. Mm. And I was like, wow, these guys get it. You know, that despite what you were saying, the scoreboard said, you know, a three Athena was really the better. It was because we were way more talented or we didn't do our standard. So I just oh. want to interject that because that's really powerful. No, I'm so glad you said that. And, and you know, the reverse can be true. You can come up four points short on the scoreboard, but you guys can look each other in the eye and most importantly, look in the mirror and say, you know what? We played as well as we could have played today. We, we played hard. We played smart. We were consistent. In this case, the other team was simply a little bit better than we are. And, and while losing will still sting and it's, it's not anyone's preference, you should still be able to sleep well that night knowing, hey, we did the best we were capable of. We just didn't win. And right. uh, that, that leads me kind of to the second part of that, that quote that I think is incomplete. And that is, it makes the assumption that you win or you learn as if the learning is automatic, that it, the learning, and it, it's not automatic. You have to be very intentional about learning when you do lose. And, and coach, I think you teed that up brilliantly. You know, after a tough loss, you need to be able to, to say, okay, what things did we do well? You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't that we didn't do anything right tonight. We came up a few points short, but let's let's highlight the things we did well so that we can double down on those in the future. But let's also have the courage and the honesty and the vulnerability to ask ourselves what we could have done better so that we can do those things better next time. Or we can focus on those, you know, over the next couple of days of practice as we lead up to our next game. But you have to be intentional. Le learning is, you know, is not something that just magically happens. Learning has to be intentional, you know? So uh, I love the mantra of win or lose, uh, or excuse me, win or learn. I just think that it's incomplete for those reasons. Now Absolutely. to your original question, and, and boy, you guys can see, I can get long winded <laughs> talking, about <laughs> both, <laughs> talking about both detaching from outcomes and being in the present moment. And I'm so glad that you brought up Eckhart Tolle's name. I mean, that's, this is one of the things that I think is so cool about living in the world today is I can say Eckhart Tolle has had a profound impact on my life and I've never met him. He has no idea who I am or that I even exist. It's only through his work that I've been able to adopt these principles. And, and to me, there's something really cool about that. I mean, there's obviously something awesome about getting to meet people like you all and coach and I go way back, like having a relationship with someone that impacts your life is cool, but I think it's equally cool in the reverse. And, and I actually take tremendous pride in knowing there are people that have read my books that I have not and will not ever meet, get an opportunity to meet, but something I said in those books might add value to their life. And, and to me, that's, that's really cool. And, you know, when Eckhart Tolle talks about being in the present moment, and, and he's really the one that reshaped my definition of stress. Uh, yeah, it was a game changer for me. And, and I will say, and I'll say on both sides, um, I believe being fully present as consistently as possible might be the most important skill that humanity needs to continue to develop. I mean, because it increases performance, it increases connection and relationships. I mean, it's the epicenter of being your best self. And yet with that being said, and I'll only speak through the first person, being in the present moment is arguably my biggest challenge every single day of my life. Uh, because like everybody watching and listening to this right now, it is very easy for me to be distracted by something in the past or to get anxious about something in the future, you know, to, to have my mind wander to either the past or the future, two places that I can't do anything about. Um, so it's very easy to, to leave that present moment. So it's something I'm very cognizant of. And, you know, well, on that note, I'll say that everything I share from stage, everything I share in my books and everything I'll share in this conversation, I'm not coming from a place of mastery. Like this is all stuff that I am still working on uh, at times I struggle with, I'm challenged by. Now, what I can say with tremendous pride, 
Uh, I'm very proud of the progress that I've made and I'm very proud of the path that I'm on. I am more present consistently today than I was a year ago and certainly more than I was 10 years ago. And I have the confidence that if two years from now, you guys have me back on your show or we meet for a friendly lunch, I'll have the ability to be even more present, more consistently then than I do now. So I, I like the trajectory that I'm on, but I'm still challenged by this stuff. And, and I like that. I mean, you know, the, the, the books that I write, uh, I write them based on what it is that I'm going through in my own life. In, in essence, I write the books that I need to read myself. Right. And so, you know, the, the new book that the coach is working on right now is all about stress, stagnation and burnout. Well, why did I write a book on stress, stagnation and burnout? Because those are three things that have ailed me for years, and I'm trying to get better in those areas and haven't mastered any of them yet, but I'm better than I was before. And a good portion of the reason that I'm better in these areas goes back to your uh, original question about detachment. And in this case, I'm talking about detachment from outcomes. Um, there is, in my opinion, and this is all this is, is my perspective, there is nothing wrong with having goals. Uh, with having preferred or desired outcomes and results. I think those things can give you clarity and they can provide great direction. Mm -hmm. But for me, once I've established a goal, then I just put it on the shelf and I heighten my focus on the process of getting there. Uh, what are the, the, the behaviors, the habits, the micro steps? What are the routines that will increase the chance that I'll get the goal that I've set? And that's what I spend my time focused on. And because uh, I don't need to worry about the goal. If I can get the process right, most of the time, the goal will just take care of itself. So uh, with that, the detachment, the way, the, what, why that's so important is I've learned to detach my self-worth and my confidence and how I feel about myself and how I believe in myself. I've learned to detach that from results mm -hmm. because if I don't, then that means, and, and I can only say through, this is through personal experience because I spent 40 years doing it the other way and it did not lead to happiness. So now I'm going to try it a new way. And that is figuring out that, that would mean that when I achieve or when I hit a goal, I feel good about myself. Right. When I fall short or I don't get the goal, then I feel bad about myself. And I found that I was living on this roller coaster of emotion. You know, half the time I felt good, half the time I felt lousy. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but for me, uh, life is too short to spend half of it feeling lousy because you didn't reach a goal. Exactly. So yeah, that's why I try to detach from it. And then it goes back, and this is very poetic because it goes back to the the win or learn that I just dissected. So when I hit a goal, I, I celebrate it. You know, I feel great about it. Um, I think about what did I do to achieve this goal and how can I repeat that behavior in the future? But I also ask myself, you know, what are some things that I did that didn't necessarily help me reach this goal and how can I eliminate that in the future? And then when I fall short, because I'm detached, I don't think less of myself. I look at it through a very, you know, sterile lens, uh, an unbiased lens and just say, okay, I didn't get what I was aiming for. Why not? You know, what can I learn from this? Right. How was I complicit right. in not reaching the goal? I don't, I don't blame, complain, or make an excuse on why I didn't re reach it. I hold myself fully accountable. And then I ask myself, how was I complicit in not reaching this goal? What did I do that, that you know, caused me to not reach it? And how can I fix that moving forward? Um, but either way, I sleep well at night and I feel good about myself. And to me, that's the most important part. Yep. We're talking well with Alan not, not, John, what do you got for yeah. Alan? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious, Alan, because we've already covered um, Renuma's question about Penn State and the transition there. And I think a, a really powerful part of this conversation is your discussion on transition and how important that is. Now, just to keep on the sports, uh, on the sports college athletics theme here, something that our local audience will will resonate with and maybe me personally, because it's my alma mater, but the great Jim Beheim. Um, we know that he's on his way out at some point here. We may not know exactly when. Hopefully he stays for years to come because we love him. He's almost immortal around here. But I'm curious, whereas a, a Penn State example is, is a leader taking over in turmoil, I'm curious about, you know, another example being Roy Williams. Um, leaving UNC and then the following following year the team goes to the national championship right and that's sort of a parallel to your career as well very much successful but still pivoting and doing something new um, what advice would you give to say a Syracuse basketball program who is going to be in transition very soon but f instead of following that coming in in turmoil coming in following a, a very successful leader and and having to live up to those sort of shoes? 
Oh, what a beautiful question, John. You know, funny enough, though, my answer is very similar to what I said before, as far as the process is concerned. Uh, the process would be, you know, when you take over this new position and we'll use Syracuse, that's a perfect example. Uh, and another one that we'll actually get to see. I mean, you, you just mentioned Roy Williams transitioning to Hubert Davis, uh, but we're also going to see, you know, Coach K handing the baton to John Shire this year. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how Coach Shire does. Um, I think it's equally important to follow the same process. And the process is, OK, let's acknowledge everything that happened before. Like, let's acknowledge how successful Coach Beheim was and, and how unique and innovative uh, the Syracuse style of play has been with that 2-3 zone. Like, let's acknowledge all of the greatness that he brought to the table and let's learn from that. But at the same time, realize that that is now that there's an end to that. There's a period behind you know, his work here. And now it is time for me as the new leader or the new coach to take over. And I have to be incredibly authentic and genuine to who I am, to my personality, to my preferences, to my style. And, you know, I, I, I certainly want to keep the momentum of success going, but I need to be, you know, both humble and courageous enough and confident enough to say, I'm not Jim Beheim, So I will not coach this team the same way he did. I'm hoping to get a similar result, but I need to do it my way and, and have the courage to do that. And that's not easy to do because you and a lot of other faithful Syracuse uh, fans are going to have an expectation that there will be no dip, you know, and, and often that type of expectation is somewhat unrealistic. Like I, and this is one of the, the hard parts with, with casual fans. I don't think they always understand the nuances behind how difficult a job like that is. Um, and to be able to say, look, um, we love the Bayheim rain while he was here and Syracuse was amazing, but now we want to be fully supportive of the new coach and realize that he may choose to, to do some things slightly differently, but that's okay. You know, and, and to me, that's, what's most important. And, and for the person actually taking over, whether it's a college basketball team or a business, you have to have the confidence to say, um, I'm taking in all of the information. I'm going to learn everything I can from a variety of different capacities. I'm going to honor and respect and acknowledge what was done before me, but I'm going to have the confidence to be my own person and do it my way. And uh, that may take some patience. I may not get the result that I want, um, but similar to detaching from outcomes, th this is another area that I've made a colossal shift in my life. And I'm still plagued by it every now and then. Uh, and that's playing the very dangerous game of the comparison game, uh, which is a, a rampant game in today's society, uh, especially, you know, I think it's been exponentially heightened via social media. We're all conditioned to compare ourselves to others and who, you know, whoever and win over uh, a replacement uh, for, for coach Bayheim comes into, you know, comes in to lead the team. They don't need to compare themselves to him. He right. did what he did. And now they need to do what they're going to do. And, and to me, that's the reason uh, Hubert Davis did such a brilliant job in his first year with UNC. You know, he acknowledged that before him, you know, Dean Smith is one of the best coaches of all time. Roy Williams is one of the best coaches of all time. I mean, I, I know not in perfect sequential order, but he's basically following two Hall of Famers and he still coached that team the best way he knew how. Now, because he's a Carolina guy, because he grew up in that system, many of his values and procedures and routines were very similar to what they did because that's also what he believes in. Uh, I'm not saying that you throw everything out and start from scratch. You know, if, if there's some of the things that coach Bayheim has implemented that are also genuine and authentic to you, then absolutely use them and implement them, but just keep in mind that they're different. And, yeah, and, and likewise, just sorry to interject here, but I was curious because it's, it's similar, not just in college basketball, but in, but in your own life, I mean, to, to be able to have that continuity of, well, this is a different role now that I have as a keynote and, and an author and everything, but, but I'm going to take some of what I learned from the basketball side of your career and that continuity to, yes, this is new, but that consistency remains. How, has that surprised you at all? Like, like how much you've been able to take from a previous career? No, it, it, the reason it doesn't surprise me is I, I believe in living my life based on principles and, and principles for the most part have very high utility and can be used in any area of life. I mean, the, the core fundamentals that I use to run my business, to write a book, to speak, uh, heck for that matter, the core values I use to parent my own children, 
these things are all interchangeable. You know, I, I'm not one guy on stage and then I live by a different set of principles and values when I write. And then I, I, I throw all of those hats off and then I parent my children completely different. And, and then I've got to be someone, a fourth person when I come on here to do this show with you guys. No, I live by those same values. And, and the goal of all of my core values is to get me to show up to be my best self. Now, what, what, what's required of me is different in each of those positions. You know, what's required of me as a parent is slightly different than what's required of me as a keynote speaker right. or a podcast guest. And that's okay. I have to be able to, to be chameleon-like enough and nuanced enough to, to, to fit with whatever it is that I'm, whoever it is that I'm serving, but my values never change. My desire of being the best that I can be and be the best person I can be, that doesn't change. Um, so it was funny when I, when I made the change from being a basketball performance coach to a corporate keynote speaker, I didn't really look at it as though my job was changing that much. What I looked at it was my audience is changing and my delivery method is changing. I still very much consider myself a performance coach. I just now coach folks more on the business and life side, and I don't do very much coaching on the athleticism and the running and jumping side, but the framework hasn't changed a bit. And great, great, you got some great points. Uh, really awesome, Alan. I, you know, interesting, I, I wanna share one quick story and then I'm, I'm gonna ask you about habits. Uh, but before I do that, uh, it was interesting. Early in my career, my second varsity job, I took over a small school that was more noted for football. Uh, and, but, uh, you know, they, they had really some high energy kids. And I was excited about that. The interesting thing, when I took over, there was uh, the kind of the king in the league was this guy. And he was an amazing coach. And they won every year. And every coach except for me, because I didn't know anything about him, um, couldn't stand him. They were jealous because he just kept winning. The funny part is, is I, this was a good lesson for me because I said, you know what? I'm not jealous of him. I want to go learn what the heck he's doing. <laughs> we became very good friends and he helped me immensely, you know, on how to organize a program. So I think your comparison thing, because we still get caught up in that. Mm -hmm. But shifting gears a little bit, because I know in both books, you talk a lot about developing habits. And I think, uh, when, you know, as a young leader, I think it's something we really need to touch on. So tell you know, you, you've worked with some of the most outstanding basketball players in the world. You've also now worked with a lot of high level leaders. Uh, what could you tell us? And, and certainly the, some things you probably implement in your life. What are some of the top, maybe three habits that you see that successful people do consistently? Well, before we get to the tactical, just looking at habits in general and, and habits are the things we do unconsciously and the things we do consistently. And there was actually a, a Duke University study that found that 42% of everything we do during our waking hours is habitual, mm -hmm. which means almost half of everything we do from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed is on autopilot. Like we've grooved a series of repeatable behaviors and we've usually grooved those because they provide us some level of comfort. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to have the humility and the vulnerability and the self-awareness to be introspective enough to look at those habits and ask yourself, you know, what percentage of these habits are taking me closer to the person that I'm striving to become? And what percentage of these are undermining my ability to do that? I mean, literally asking yourself, what percentage of these habits are helping me and which of these are hindering me? Mm -hmm. um, usually when I'm speaking to a group, and I can say this to the three of you because I consider the three of you to be high performers and say, okay, my evaluation of you three is you are high performers. So the most important question I can ask you is, are you three high performers because of your habits or are you three high performers in spite of your habits? And it's an important question to ask. And, and I've seen both. I mean, I, I wouldn't name names because I, I don't believe in, in diminishing folks that I've worked with, but I've worked with players that have made it all the way to the NBA who initially had some really poor habits. They just happened to be so unbelievably talented and gifted that they were able to get away with some of the habits. I mean, some of the most comical ones, you know, especially when I was uh, working in the high school space, you know, uh, I mean, I can think of a player as, one of the best players on the planet at present. And he ate an awful diet when he was in high school. I mean, it was awful. It didn't detract from his ability to still be one of the best high school players in the country. I mean, he, he was just better than everybody else, but what he was smart enough to understand. And, and hopefully I was able to help him help guide him was okay. That's good enough for you while you're in high school. But when you move up to play in college, 
that could start to catch up with you. And then certainly when you move on to the pros, that could really catch up with you because every level that you move up, you need to continue to find ways to separate yourself. You know, that, that when, you know, right now uh, you, you, you are taller and more athletic and more skilled than everybody you're playing against. So that's good enough. But when you move up a couple of levels, everybody's tall, everybody's athletic, everybody's skilled, everybody knows how to play. That's no longer the separator. So you have to figure something else out. So this whole thing of am I a high performer because of or in spite of is a really, really important question. And I don't want anyone to ever be stifled by perfection. I would never in a million years look in this webcam and tell you guys I have 100% perfect habits because I don't. Now, what I can say is, the overwhelming majority of the things I do regularly, I do believe serve me and move me forward. You know, I also don't believe there's anything as a perfect habit or a, a perfect morning routine. You know, what works for me in the morning might not work for you guys. Right. You know, the most important part is figuring that out for yourself. And, and that's, again, goes back to the self-awareness and being authentic and genuine. So I'm always happy to share some of the kind of tactical approaches, but I always preface it with, just because this works for me doesn't mean it works for someone else. And that's okay. And, and I bring that up because I think social media is riddled with these quote unquote gurus that say, you know, here is the perfect morning routine. And I don't know that there is such a thing, you know, my perfect morning routine might be different than what you guys are, are perfect, but just being able to figure that out is important. And it does start with our habits. So for me, what's important is trying to continually tweak and up-level my habits, just making sure that the 50% of the things I do when I'm awake, that most of those are contributing to me being a better person and, and evolving and growing and improving. And if I can fill my bucket with mostly positive habits and at least be aware of the habits I have that maybe aren't serving me so well, uh, that's a huge first step. And that is something that I've noticed. Again, it doesn't matter if you're an executive at a Fortune 500 company or you're one of the best basketball players in the world. I can promise you, you are not there by accident. You are there as a result of the things you repeatedly do. Uh, so most high performers mostly have good habits. Right. And the check-ins, you uh, that is so important. Uh, like I realized like yesterday, last night, uh, every night before I go, go to bed, I check in with myself. Like, okay, what are the things that I did well? What are the things I didn't do well? And I was a little bit upset. Like I did not reach some of the goals that I wanted to. But again, I did not put stress on myself because I knew that I'm in the process. So one day it can be, I can lapse on something. Uh, so one of the things that I have found out and it's so true, like habit, uh, because I'm a Muslim, I usually wake up early in the morning for my morning prayer at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. So automatically it gave me some time ahead from everybody else. And Kobe Bryant, I've, uh, I was fascinated, I'm fascinated with all these uh, elite stars, their lifestyle. He was in one of the documentary, he was asked like, what is losing to you? And he smiled, a big smile and said that losing was exciting to him because he uh, meant that he need to learn more things. There are a few more things that he doesn't know. So these kind of, uh, I know that you shared some of the stories. It would be great if you could share that, uh, that story about Kobe Bryant that you learned, like one of the things that you learned from him, that you are also practicing yourself. So all these uh, from these star athletes. What, what I'll do is I'll give kind of a, a quick summary slash overview of that story. And there's, there's kind of two stories that are interconnected. And then I'll encourage anyone watching or listening right now uh, to go to my YouTube channel and watch the full story with all of the details. But ultimately, um, I had a chance back in 2007 to work the first Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. And I got a chance to watch one of his really early morning workouts. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're getting up at four in the morning to pray, he's up even before you in the gym putting up shots. Yeah. And uh, I just remember being so surprised that he was so committed to working on the basics and the fundamentals. I mean, he was doing some pretty rudimentary drills. Now he was doing them with tremendous effort and he was doing them with unbelievable precision, but the stuff he was doing was not fancy at all. And later that day at camp, when I asked him why, and, and I said verbatim, you're the best player in the world. Why are you doing such basic drills? Uh, he flashed that smile that you just referenced. And he said, because the best never get bored with the basics. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier about I, I try to live my life based on a handful of core principles and values. I consider those my basics, my fundamentals, and try not to deviate from those. Um, but one thing that I did learn from Kobe um, about why he chose to get up that early, uh, he said, 
even the most dedicated and and ambitious NBA player is going to work out twice a day. You know, they're going to work out twice a day for two to three hours, you know, usually mid morning and then like early afternoon. Uh, And he said, these guys are, are, are looking to become the best of the best. And he said, well, if I only do what they're doing, then I'll only be as good as they are. If I want to separate myself, then I need to put in extra work. So in Kobe's mind, he wanted to get up before them and get in his first workout. So, you know, he's coming home from his first workout while they're going to the gym for their first workout. Mm -hmm. And then they're coming home from their first workout while he's going to the gym for his second workout. And he said, I'll always be one up on them. And he understood the kind of the law of compounding interest in time and said, look, if I do this, not just for weeks and months, but if I have this approach for years and even decades, then I'll just extend that separation. You know, I'll extend that gap between me and them and they'll never be able to catch me. Um, and that's very congruent with the Mamba mentality. And, and I actually, I, I like the thought process behind that, but I will say, and, and this is just a slight caveat to that. Kobe was somewhat of an anomaly. He, he was, he was cut from a different cloth than most human beings. And the reason I say that is generally speaking, as far as the way I view the world, and that's all this is, there is no judgment here. There's no right or wrong, good or bad. The way I view the world, very rarely do I think more equals better. Uh, very li- rarely do I think, you know, the answer to anyone listening to write this, if you're working in business, uh, I don't think the answer to your business being more successful is you working more hours. You know, if you're working, if you think every CEO works 12 hours a day and you want to be the best, so you decide to work 16 to 18 hours a day, in most instances, I think that's a mistake. Um, I don't think it's sustainable. I think it leads to burnout. Um, But Kobe was cut from a different cloth. So I don't necessarily think more is better. I always think better is better. But that's also part of what made Kobe Kobe, you know, his level of effort and focus and precision during his workouts was absolutely unparalleled. Like there was no one that worked harder than he did or with more focus or more intention. So it wasn't he wasn't just trying to log hours, but that was his approach. But I say that because I never want the takeaway from that to be, oh, well, I'll just work more Um, because then I think your life will will increasingly become unbalanced and it will lead to other problems. So anyone listening to this better is better. More is not necessarily. But one important thing that you uh, talked about is the basics. He was practicing the basic skills. It was, yes. it, they weren't like a really fascinating throw and all those kind of things. And I think this is what we often miss, like the basics. Uh, so when I'm preparing myself for this interview, I'm going through your books, I'm going through your YouTube channel and all those things, learning more about you. Uh, because if I like, like, I will just throw questions at you. That is not going to be enough. Uh, so I need to know the basics of what you know and all those things to hone on it. So I think in business also, do you see like um, they need the how are how do you coach the uh, business leaders to go for their basics? Well, it's it do exactly what you just said. So anyone listening to this right now, you know, I assume if you're listening, you are either a leader or an emerging leader. And I want you to ask yourself, like, what are the basic building blocks? First of all, let's just look at leadership kind of on an esoteric level. Like, what are the basic building blocks of being an effective leader? And, and, and it's a rhetorical question because I want each person to answer that for themselves. I mean, if the four of us right now took out an index card and each wrote down the five qualities that we believe make the most effective leaders, my guess is we would see a little bit of overlap. There's probably one or two words that each of us would write down, but we would also see some differences and there's nothing wrong with that. What's most important, going back to what I talked about earlier when I answered John's question, um, is what's most genuine and authentic to you? Because I think, I bet the four of us could curate a list easily of 30 traits that we could all agree are important in leadership. Mm-hmm. Like easily, like it, would, it wouldn't even take two minutes to come up with that list of 30. But if you had to only pick five from that list of 30, we all might choose a different five and that's okay. So what I want each person to do is ask yourself, What do I believe the most, let's just say five, the five most important qualities of a leader are, and then those are kind of your basics and your fundamentals and say, okay, what are the things I need to do routinely with intention and thoughtfulness to improve those specific characteristics? And those are the fundamentals that you need to work on. Uh, Same thing in your very specific industry. You know, we could have a wide variety of leaders, you know, being the leader of the Syracuse basketball team or the Penn State football team uh, is being a leader, but there's some nuanced differences between being the CEO at Pepsi and the CEO at Under Armour. Like 
All of them are leadership and they all require those basic tenants, but there's some industry nuances and, and things to your specific company and ask yourself, okay, you know, if, if I'm running Under Armour, what are the basics of running a, a footwear and apparel company? Right. What are the things that everyone on our team needs to be privy to and work towards mastery of during the unseen hours in order for us to sell as many shoes and apparel as we can? So it's always about getting clarity and refinement on what those basics are and then working those into what you do on a daily basis. And I know in my own life, anytime I don't believe I'm getting the result that I should, whether it's from stage or I'm with my kids and I'm not the parent that I believe I'm capable of, it's usually because I've started to leave the basics. Right. It's usually because I've stopped refining the fundamentals. And thankfully now I have a level of awareness where I can catch myself pretty quick and just remind myself, all right, Alan, get back to the basics. I mean, right. the goal is to never leave them in the first place. I mean, let's, let's be clear. But as I said, I'm flawed. You know, I'm, I'm fallible. I make mistakes and have lapses in judgment. So occasionally I veer away from the basics and anytime I refocus the lens and I get back to them, I usually see my performance escalate immediately. Yeah. And that's, that's all part of leading yourself, which I know coach part of coaches, big leadership philosophy that he speaks about all the time is that the first person you have to lead effectively, right? Coach is it's yourself. And I think that's so important to be able to, you know, you're, you're a CEO of a large company in the business world. I know you talk to a lot of them, but we've seen plenty of CEOs who don't lead themselves effectively. So how are they supposed to lead, lead others effectively? For you, what are some of those main traits, which of course is unique to your experience, but, but in leading themselves, what are, what are some main traits that you've seen that, that have been effective for these leaders that they become a better leader of themselves that therefore trickles down to being better leaders of others? Boy, several pop-ups. I'll, I'll throw a couple of them out there and then we can dissect any of them that you want. Um, it's been my experience that the most effective leaders do a masterful job of blending confidence with humility. Um, they are incredibly confident in their skill set. They're confident in their ability to lead. They're confident in their influence and impact because they've earned the right to be confident through demonstrated performance and work during the unseen hours. However, they always brush that confidence with humility and they remind themselves that I, I still need to be open to feedback. Uh, I still need to be coached that no matter how good I am, I can still get better. Uh, so I'm not playing the comparison game. It doesn't matter to me that my company is doing better than your company. All that matters to me is, am I as good as I'm capable of? So that's the only yardstick they use to measure. So they do a tremendous job of, of earning confidence but always brushing it with, with humility. Um, very similar to that, I find that the most effective leaders uh, are incredibly curious. Like they're always asking questions. You know, they, they never rest on the way things have always been done. Uh, in fact, that's their least favorite answer to any question is, oh, that's the way we've always done it. You know, so they're, they're creative and they're fascinated, which usually leads to innovation and usually says, okay, well, is there a better way? Yeah, some of these you know, procedures and, and processes we have are working great. Let's continue to do them. Some of them need some refinement. Some of them need some updating, you know, so um, being curious and being fascinated and asking questions. And, and of course, part of asking questions and this, what I believe might be the most important skill set for a leader to develop is the ability to actively listen. You know, something the three of you are doing so beautifully now, as I continue <laughs> to give these really long winded answers is is the ability to really listen and connect with what the other person is saying. So active listening, I think, is a fundamental that really sh should be on everybody's plate. I mean, it doesn't matter whether you're a keynote speaker, a CEO, a college basketball coach, or a parent, your ability to listen will, will increase that. And, uh, you know, th those are a couple that just, just come to mind. But I think if, you know, if every, if every single day you say, look, I'm going to try to improve both my confidence and my humility. I'm going to try to be a very curious and fascinated, active listener. Uh, another one, you know, is I, I think uh, elite leaders are, uh, they're both empathetic and compassionate, you know, that they, they understand, they might hold people to incredibly high standards of excellence. And I think they should do that. But they're also empathetic and compassionate that, that not everybody is on the exact same trajectory that they are and that people have challenges and difficulties in life. And, you know, I think the leaders over the past two years in particular, as we've all navigated this global pandemic, I think the leaders that have led with empathy and compassion with their teams have far surpassed those that, that are a little bit colder and more calloused. You know, this, this old school approach of, you know, just kind of just do your job, you mm -hmm. know. 
I don't know that that works. I don't, I don't think you get the same level of buy-in and believe in or connection with your people and, and, and don't get it twisted. Uh, I still believe in holding people to a very high standard of excellence. And I believe in being incredibly honest and forthright when someone steps out of bounds or makes a mistake. So this is not about going easy on people. This is about treating people with, with kindness, uh, with thoughtfulness, being inclusive, you know, promoting a, a diverse uh, uh, work environment, uh, not just diversity in ethnicity and in gender, but diversity of thought, diversity of background, diversity of perspective. Um, so that's another one. On top of empathy and compassion, uh, I think the leaders that lean into diversity, all types of diversity, are outperforming those that don't. Yeah, and especially that that listening point there. I've heard that's important to be a good husband too. I've <laughs> been trying to work on that one. I love it. It is. You know, we're close to wrap it up, and we really appreciate your time. I do have one more question. You know, starting out, you know, you've been around now for a while, uh, and I, I know you've written two great books. But w- if you were to recommend to a person just starting a leadership position, can you give us maybe three books other than your two that I highly uh, think are great that you would recommend that a leader read uh, to help them on their path to become a more effective leader? Well, I assume present company excluded, so I'm, I'm not going to recommend your book, although please know I, I, I do, and I, I hope everybody reads it, but uh, so it doesn't look like you led the witness in any way. I'll, I'll share some outside of that. Um, I will say what, arguably the most influential book that I've ever read is Leading with the Heart by Coach K. You know, I, I certainly uh, love James Franklin and, and respect your allegiance, John, to Jim Beheim, but I've, I've been drinking the Coach K Kool-Aid for my entire professional career. Uh, and I found his first book, Leading with the Heart, um, was incredibly helpful and really changed my perspective on, on how I viewed the world. Um, there's another one that, that folks might not be as familiar with, although they may, because he sold over a million copies. Uh, a buddy of mine named Michael Bungay Stanier wrote a book called The Coaching Habit, and it's one of the best books I've ever writ- uh, read. Um, it is incredibly practical and actionable, um, and it talks a lot about asking great questions and being a great listener. Uh, so I would definitely recommend that. And since we touched on habits so much today, um, I assume most everyone's already read it because he sold 5 million copies, I think, but Atomic Habits by James Clear uh, is about as good as it gets. Um, I know that for the most part, everything that I teach or share in regards to habits uh, has been heavily influenced by James. I mean, I've, I've devoured his, his, new le- his newsletter and his book. Uh, it was so good. I, I read the physical book twice and I bought the audio book to listen to um, while I was you know, working out. And I've listened to at least three dozen interviews uh, of him on podcasts. So I'm, I'm a huge fan of James' work uh, and that shows in what I talk about with habits. But those, those are three to get started uh, that, I, that I hope people find helpful. Great. So one last question I have to ask because it's uh, also related to your book, uh, Sustain Your Game. Uh, one of the things many people often blame me about, like, you are, you will be burning out, you're doing so many things, and you need to slow down and all those things. Um, but one of the things I have found out that I really enjoy what I'm doing. So I'm not feeling the burnout, even when I'm working on those things. And one of uh, the favorite quote, uh, Frederick Nietzsche said that one must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. So, uh, so what, what is your uh, take on like stress management? When should we stop? When should we go on? Is stress good? Can we be empathetic to ourselves on letting go of things? What is your concluding take on this? Well, I, we could easily do another hour or two just on that question because <laughs> there's so much to share. So I'll try and be as concise as possible, which I know I have not done a great job of on this show so far. Yeah, I, I, I love to talk. <laughs> well, t- two things come to mind. One, I'll do them in reverse order. From a burnout standpoint, uh, burnout is not just from working long hours. It's when your long hours are not in alignment with what you find meaningful. That's what causes burnout. Um, I mean, I, I know folks that only work 20 hours a week and they're incredibly burned out. And I know other folks that work 80 hours a week and they're not anywhere close to burnout because they find so much purpose and meaning in the work that they do. Yeah. So if, if you find yourself working at long hours and making sacrifices, but you don't find your work meaningful or purposeful, 
if you don't find your work fascinating, if your work is not in alignment with your core values, uh, if you don't feel like you're making a contribution to something bigger than yourself, if you don't feel like your work is in service of others, those are usually red flags that you could be approaching burnout. So uh, now, as I said before, I'm not an advocate of working 60 or 80 hours a week. And I personally don't do that, um, but that's just a preference. Uh, but it, it burnout really has to do with finding meaning. So that was the reason that I left the basketball training space to come over to the corporate keynoting side. I was no longer fascinated by or finding meaning in training high school basketball players to run faster and jump higher. Like I loved every minute of that for the 15 plus years that I did it. But when I started to, to be less curious about that and less fascinated by it, and, and it just didn't get me excited, that's when I knew I had to make the pivot to something that does. And, and right now I find so much meaning in my work, you know, whether it's on stage or writing a book or sharing this time with you guys, like, I love this. Now, if 10 years from now, I don't love this, I will pivot and transition again. I'll find something else to apply certain skill sets and mindsets to. So for the, from a burnout standpoint, it has to do with meaning and then stress. We could easily do an entire podcast on stress, but to me, the most important part, and this is what I learned from Eckhart Tolle's work is that stress is the desire for things to be different than they are in the present moment. Mm -hmm. That, that stress does not come from outside events. It comes from your resistance to those events. Right. So it's not caused by what people say, what people do, circumstances or events. It's caused by you pushing against those things, you, you know, your perspective of them, how you internalize them. So the reason I find that so liberating and empowering is that now I have control over my own stress level. Um, this doesn't mean that I like everything that goes on in the world. And it certainly doesn't mean that everything that happens to and around me is my preference. It just simply means I don't control those things but I do control how thoughtful I am in my response to those things. And if I can choose more intentional, thoughtful responses, I will lower my own stress level. And, and that's something, I mean, I have put into practice over these last couple of years, which has been a great time to practice because this pandemic has given us no shortage of repetitions oh, yeah. to practice. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the, the way the last two years have unfolded, uh, have they been my preference? No, most certainly not. Um, but I've been able to drastically lower my stress level during a global pandemic because I've been much more um, accountable to and thoughtful to and responsive to the way I choose to show up in those areas. So uh, if you can learn to manage stress and you can learn to, to avoid burnout, you give yourself a really good chance of, of sustaining not only excellence, but fulfillment for a long, long time. True. Yes, Thank Alan you. Stein. And wow, a great, great discussion, Alan. we we definitely took some value from it. So I'm, I can only assume our audience is going to take a lot of value from, uh, from what you've said. I want to second the coach K book recommendation. Um, even though obviously big Bayheim fan and, uh, go Cuse on the basketball court, we're enemies, but gee, the man has so much leadership advice. And I think that's so powerful that we can take from so many different people, enemies or friends, you know, in the sports world, gee, there's a lot to learn from Tom Brady. And I don't know if, uh, if us Bills fans are, are happy about that at all, but there is, there's a lot to learn from a lot of different people. And certainly we learned a lot from you. Finally, um, speaking of books, you do have two. So we'd like you to just uh, let us know where, where we can get those and maybe a little brief description of them and uh, what we'll learn from them. And we'll also have them linked down in the show notes as well. And then as we wrap up, just let us know uh, how we can get in touch with you or how we can learn more about you. Oh, I'll be happy to. This was such a lovely discussion. I appreciate the three of you immensely. This was so much fun. Um, AllensteinJr.com is my primary site. Uh, I have a supplemental site, strongerteam.com, that has info on my podcast and both books, uh, as well as an online course I have. And I do some exclusive one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, I'm also very accessible and very responsive on social media at Alan Stein Jr. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Uh, so if any part of this discussion resonated with you, if something struck a chord, if you want to ask a question, even if you want to challenge something I shared, just shoot me a DM on Instagram or LinkedIn. I take a lot of pride in getting back with people. Uh, and then as you mentioned, both books, uh, Raise Your Game, which is to show folks how to reach the proverbial mountaintop, and then Sustain Your Game, which teaches folks how to sustain that and stay there, uh, can easily be found on Amazon or Audible uh, or wherever you like to get your books and audiobooks, it's it's pretty easily found as well. But this was so much fun. Uh, certainly, if this resonated with anyone, whether you're here in the States or you're in Bangladesh and you were staying up extra late to, to finish this conversation, just shoot me a note and I'd be happy to uh, 
be happy to have this, you know, continue this chat. And as they said at the beginning, make sure you guys do everything you can to support this show, uh, to like it, to share it, to comment it, to leave a rating and review, uh, whether it's a podcast or a book, leaving ratings and reviews is one of the best ways that you can support either the host or the author, uh, because that it then gets the podcast or the book in front of more people. So uh, anytime you can do that, please know that both hosts and authors appreciate you immensely. Thank you. Hey, right back at you, Alan. We, uh, we appreciate you, Alan. that for sure. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening to the Limitless Leadership Lounge this week. Um, as Alan just perfectly said, he stole my outro, but that's great. He <laughs> said it a lot more uh, wonderfully than I would have. So thank you, Alan, for that. Yeah, if you're on Apple Podcasts or uh, Spotify or Amazon, Audible is another place where we get a lot of reviews. Leave, drop us one there. We'd really appreciate that. And of course, check out Alan's websites down in the show notes below and Alan's book is, books as well. You you can get those uh, linked down in the show notes as well. So check that out. We'll catch you next week for another tri-generational conversation for emerging leaders. Thanks for having us on today. It's the Limitless Leadership Lounge.